I love a verse that's not on your page, but you might want to make the reference to this. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. Paul is writing there, and he says, For now we see in a mirror dimly. It's a word for a glass. Uh, We see in this glass, and we see ourselves dimly, and we see life almost as through a clouded image. We can tell something's there. We can't make out fully what it is. He goes on and says, But then, referring to the day that we see him face to face, he says, We will see then face to face, I know in part, in other words, I know a little bit now, but then I shall know just as I am known. It's interesting wording there that Paul uses, but he says, I'm going to know Christ just as Christ knows me. That there's this level of intimacy that is defined by being known and fully knowing. And that really works for us in marriage as well. That's what we want to get to is a place where we feel like I am fully known by my spouse. They know me every part of me, and I know them, every part of them. So this is our goal. I've got a definition there that I think is a working definition for us tonight. Intimacy is the result of two people willing to be completely vulnerable, there's that word, or naked with each other as they freely share, trust, care, hope, and love. I know sometimes we look at the book of Genesis and the story of Adam and Eve, and it says, and they were both naked and they were not ashamed. And we kind of get this picture of, wow, that is the ultimate picture in intimacy. Uh, I think there's a, there is beauty there in that picture, this idea of them being fully vulnerable with one another, completely naked and not ashamed with one another. But by the end of our time tonight, I think we're going to see something deeper in that story what it means to be vulnerable, naked, and not be ashamed with one another. So let's go ahead and start in tonight. Number one, filling in some blanks here. Intimacy is not a point as much as it is a deepening process of becoming one in body, soul, and spirit. Sometimes we like to think of intimacy as a point, as an act, as an action. We think of it as sex. We say we were intimate with each other. And we can use it in that context. That's, that's, that's a working definition and word there. But intimacy is not so much a point, an action, a place you arrive at, as much as it is a process you walk through of deepening your love with one another. Some other words you might could uh, equate that with is um, maturity. Maturity is not a point that you arrive at. It's a process you walk in. And the same is true for intimacy. I don't... It doesn't matter how many years you've been married, how close you are right now, you are still in process of developing intimacy. As you continue to grow together, you're going to continue to deepen that intimacy. So when we think about that, of course, God is in the process of deepening our intimacy with him. He's drawing us closer to himself. He doesn't have to let his guard down. We're the ones that need to let our guard down. But he's drawing us. have this passage here in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5. It says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. I love it because it points out this, these three areas here, body, soul, and spirit. When we think about intimacy, we think about us as couples knowing each other. These describe the levels at which we can know each other. So let's just walk down this scale here, if we will. We'll look at these in deepening levels of intimacy. So we might put soul intimacy as the top layer, as the surface layer. So some of the things there, as, as casual intimacy, you might say, we, are free, we have freedom and joy in freely sharing daily routines, events, and surface level conversations. You know that part of life where everything's just kind of surface, everything's just kind of safe, everything uh, is easy. It's kind of like maybe those days when you first started dating, you hadn't really revealed yourself completely to them yet, your heart and your intentions and your weaknesses and struggles and hopes and dreams, 
But you have this level of casual intimacy, safe, general, not too exposed. But as you walk down the path, you think, okay, I'm going to get to the place where I'm going to share what I think about some things. And you can only do that if you feel like you're in a place where it's safe to share some thoughts, maybe if they're even opposing thoughts with the other person, some thoughts that you might are unsure about whether they're going to receive or accept you afterwards, but you do. So you move down the scale. We're deepening the intimacy. Then you get to a place where you start sharing emotions, how you feel about some things, and that takes a little bit more safe environment, a little bit more security, another place of trust, be able to share what you feel about something, still wondering, am I going to be accepted? Am I going to be approved? But then as that happens, as you begin to see God had brought you together, you married. And then comes physical intimacy, another layer of intimacy. It's not the base, it's not the bottom, it's not the end goal, but it is a layer of intimacy. So there is affection where you have freedom and joy and giving and receiving touch, kisses, and caresses. These are your, your bodies. You are sharing those with one another. And then there is sex. There's the freedom and joy in sharing your bodies and passions, giving and receiving pleasure, complete vulnerability. There's surrender. There's release and delight. There's intimacy there. But this is not the deepest level of intimacy because it's possible to be physically intimate but not experience the depths of true heart intimacy. Right, everybody? It's possible to be physically intimate but not be completely heart intimate with one another. So there's deeper levels here that God takes us to. These are where he really looks for us to go to, even as couples. This, are, this is where spiritual intimacy enters in. This is where you share faith. This is where now you have this freedom and joy to openly share trust with one another, your dependence upon God, dependence upon each other, the vulnerabilities of your heart, the very weaknesses that you have, and spiritual experiences. And for some people, if you've never experienced those growing up in a family, if you've never had those in relationship with other people, that can be kind of hard to do for some people. To open up and talk about, here's where I'm struggling right now. Here's where God's at work in my life right now. Here's what I'm really trusting him to do. Here's where I'm really needing you to pray for me. For some, they had good role models. They saw that in a family. But if you didn't have that growing up, if you didn't see that, if you never were around anyone that practiced that, these can all be brand new concepts, that level of heart vulnerability. So sharing faith, sharing hope. I don't mean just hope like, well, I hope it's a good year for the Texas Rangers kind of thing. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about hope that, that connects with your real deep longings of your heart, the things that you dream about, the things that are attached to your, your, your inner self, your fears and your struggles and the place where you connect with God in that, the place where you're able to pray together the place where you're able to share your heart at that level, that is where spiritual intimacy begins to truly deepen at that point because now you've exposed the core of who you are. You've exposed your heart. You've exposed your weaknesses. You've exposed everything about just who you are as a person. And this is where intimacy happens. The bottom one, I think, is this place of, of love where there's freedom and joy to openly share love for each other in real patience, in real forgiveness, in acceptance, knowing the other person is so crazy different than you at times. And you share this love for God at this level where you have conversations about how grateful you are for God's presence in your life, his work in your life, where you are grateful for what he's done for you the kind of stuff that you find it difficult to talk about anywhere, you find the courage to talk about in that relationship, and you share that together. When a couple hits that level, they reach a level of real intimacy. And this, I believe, is what God is driving every couple to, to this place. This is what he wants for us. Not just sex, but true heart connection 
at the deepest level of who we are so that walls down, full acceptance, full vulnerability, there's nothing about me that my spouse doesn't know, there's nothing about them that I don't know, and I'm loved and known by them. This is intimacy. This is where we're headed for the rest of our study tonight. Number two, spiritual intimacy requires intentionally opening doors that lead to greater security and release. You see, this kind of intimacy we're talking about is not, it doesn't just come natural. It's not something that just happens. It's not, it's not spontaneous. It requires intentionality. You don't, you don't develop discipline in your life just by random occurrences of life. It doesn't just happen that way. Maturity just doesn't randomly happen. It happens when there's intentionality. It happens with work. It happens with sacrifice. It happens with a plan. And the same is true for intimacy. You don't just arrive there one day and say, oh, how did we get here? No, it happens through very intentional work of opening doors and creating a space for your spouse to walk into the room and share themselves with you completely. So you have with you there a second page that is a list of questions. These are 40 questions. Um, I found some online. Some of these I've, I've added to and written myself here. This is just a starting place. Maybe you've asked each other these questions before. Maybe you've had these kind of conversations. Maybe you haven't. If you haven't, or if you have in the past, it would be worth walking through these again or walking through them for the first time. And some of these will require some real vulnerability. It will require some openness that may be new to you. But walking in a space where it's safe to answer these and the other person doesn't laugh at you, doesn't mock you, doesn't criticize you, doesn't condemn you, but truly hears you, you are intentionally creating a space for them to be vulnerable. Um, I've referred to that in the past as a, a space of grace where you create a, an environment where your spouse feels comfortable letting down their guard. And that takes work. Not just for the man, but for a woman. To create a space where your spouse is going to feel, all right, I can talk here. I can expose my heart. I can tell my fears. And I know I'm going to be loved. I'm going to be accepted. I'm going to be known as I am known and loved as I am known. That takes work. So creating those spaces are really what we are about then as couples. These questions can help with that. Just the daily routine of life can help with that when you are truly walking with the intention of being spiritually intimate. And it means, it really means having to consciously do this every day. It's not something you just do one time and say, oh, that was it, man, we reached spiritual intimacy. No. It doesn't happen that way. It is a, a continual process that sometimes has to start over every day because events happen, uh, struggles happen in our lives. And so Heather and I have to intentionally create that space at home in conversations regularly, daily. That's why date nights, times alone are important. Because it doesn't just happen with the routines of life. In fact, it, gets, it can easily get pushed aside with work and kids and life and bills and all that kind of stuff. You intentionally say, let's create a space. Let's go out or let's stay in or let's talk or let's make a fire in the fireplace and sit together and whatever. Take the steps intentionally. Work toward that. Number three, spiritual intimacy <clears throat> involves sharing spiritual experiences. Now, that's probably the big, you know, duh of the night. Spiritual intimacy requires sharing spiritual experiences. And these, I've got some listed there for you. This can be reading Scripture together. This can be reading or listening to faith-building input. 
Uh, for example, it, maybe it's podcasts. Maybe it's a video you watch. Uh, maybe it's a book you've read or you're reading together. Maybe it's a devotional you're reading through. <clears throat> There's so many formats today, so many great ways to do that. Um, if you don't have the Bible app on your phone, they have those. There's one, if you don't have it, called the, um, what's the one called? Open Bible? Is that the one that's the most, well, it's just called Bible now. I think you can download it. And it comes with reading plans that you can use together. If not, go to a local Christian bookstore. Get on Amazon, christianbook.com, whatever it is, and find some devotionals that you can use. Find a podcast you listen to. Um, Heather's thing is she'll she'll listen to a podcast during the day or she'll watch a message online from Andy Stanley or some other pastor and say, hey, well, let's watch this and let's talk about it. And we've done that. And it opens up conversation, opens up you know, a brand new category of, of things for us to talk through. So having those moments, attending church together, praying together, serving together, those are all powerful ways to bring together what God is doing in your lives together. Now, I want, to, I want to say this. I don't want you to miss what I'm saying here. Just adding spiritual things into the conversation or into your relationship does not guarantee spiritual intimacy. Just choosing to read a passage together, listen to a podcast together, attending church together, praying before a meal those are good, but those do not necessarily guarantee spiritual intimacy because spiritual intimacy happens when you hear my heart and I hear your heart. So if you're going to read the Bible together, awesome. Talk about it afterwards. What does this mean to you? What's God say to you through this? How do we apply this? Praying together, which can be if you haven't done it before, if you've not seen a good model of that, even if you have, sometimes that can be a very uh, awkward thing for couples to do, a practice that, um, that may seem weird even at times or uncomfortable. There have been times in Heather and I's in, in my marriage that we've been better at that than others. I'll just, I'll just go ahead and tell you up front, that's not something we do a whole lot together, but I know there's a need for that. And, Heather, if you were going to say the importance of praying together, Heather said she wasn't going to talk tonight, but I'm going to put her on the spot. So you got to come up here because the camera's shining right here. Tell, tell everybody what it means to you when we do pray together. Well, that, um, it gives me security. I know, like, I know before trips, big trips or family trips and even um, meals, there was just a sense of, a oneness, a, a unif we were unified during that time. So not necessarily even a crisis was happening. It was just more of this is, we're coming together before the Lord, and we're uh, all on the same page. And it, sometimes it did happen, thank you. Sometimes it did happen when there was a crisis, and those kind of things brought us together as well. But the beauty of real spiritual intimacy is what the conversation goes to. Bible reading, yes. Attending church, yes. But the conversation afterwards, what did God say to you today? What did you hear today? What, what did that mean to you today? This is where intimacy happens. Not talking about Bible facts, but talking about truth, penetrating the heart. You see what I'm saying? This is where spiritual intimacy happens, on the level of heart connection with one another. Bible reading, prayer, attending church, those are all great ways. And doorways, they in and of themselves are not the goal. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? They are a doorway. They're not the goal. Number four, sexual intimacy is the picture of and is heightened by spiritual intimacy. The Bible uses this picture of um, a couple coming together there in Ephesians, for we are members of his body, of his flesh and his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. God has created this beautiful design. This is God created design. 
This is not evolution process at work. This is God's design that male is created male, female is created female, and the two shall come together and become one flesh. There's intentionality in that. There is wise design in that. And in that happening, we have this beautiful picture of what it means to be one with Christ, but what it truly means to be one with each other. And there's beauty there in this whole concept of a couple becoming one. Because for that to happen physically, there has to be exposure, nakedness, vulnerability. There has to be complete openness. There has to be movement. There is excitement. There is completion. There is joy and there is release. And I'm just talking about physical intimacy. But that is the beauty and the picture of real spiritual intimacy, actually. My heart exposed. My heart naked, vulnerable. My heart moving toward the other. There's entering in. There's movement. There's closeness. There's delight. There's climax. There's release. That happens in the physical, but it's only a picture of the spiritual. This is what God designs for us as well, so that in your spouse, you find they are the ones I can truly expose my heart to. Them know me. They take delight in me. I take delight in them, and I find my release in them. And when that happens on a spiritual level, and then you experience that on a physical level, it is off the charts what happens then. I believe Christians ought to be the ones who have the most fulfilling, rewarding, exciting, passionate sex lives of anybody on the planet. Because we have the ability to have the true deepest level of intimacy that of heart and spirit. And sex is just a picture of the greater intimacy that happens on the level of heart. All right. Everybody good so far? All right. Let's go on number five. Spiritual intimacy needs an initiator and a responder and lots of encouragement. So the Bible, of course, talks about this in, the, in Ephesians 5, the role of a husband, the role of a wife. Um, here's this truth again, Ephesians 5, 31. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. We've talked about this already. Husbands, you represent Christ. So in the marriage relationship, husbands, we have the responsibility as initiator of intimacy and spiritual intimacy. That's our role. How it got started in our culture that the wife is the one who goes to church, takes the kids, does the praying and all of that, I don't know how it got started, but it it is undermining the very structure and order that God has for marriage. It is to be the man who is the one who initiates the spiritual conversation the spiritual leadership, and the spiritual intimacy. That's his, that's his role. I understand if you've never seen that before, if that wasn't modeled for you, that may seem weird and awkward. I never saw that growing up. My dad didn't come really to a place of following Christ with his whole heart until he was 80. And he, he became a gentle, loving man, but I never saw in the home what it was like for a husband and a dad to be the one who is initiating spiritual conversation and uh, talking about truth and what it meant to follow Christ and how do we live out our faith. But husbands, dads, those are that's our responsibility. There are so many tools and resources for how to do that. This has been one of those. The responsibility is on us. Now, for a wife, your role is significant. 
Doesn't mean you can't ever bring up spiritual topics. That's not the point. Doesn't mean you shouldn't have a voice in it. That's not the point. Doesn't mean you shouldn't be fully engaged. That's not the point. But your role is to be that voice of encouragement and responsiveness for your husband. Because so many men have not had great role models. This is awkward for a man, and he needs a lot of encouragement. Let me just ask this. How many men in here uh, had a good spiritual role model in a dad in a home? Three. See? That's not always easy. And if you weren't trained, if you weren't taught, if you weren't encouraged in that, it can be awkward. And so, ladies... Your husband needs your encouragement. He doesn't need criticism. He doesn't need complaint. He doesn't mean, or he doesn't need, well, how come you never pray? (sighs) That's really not going to get you anywhere, ladies. That's just not going to help. He's going to need to hear things like, I really love to hear you pray. It just melts my heart. It just gives me such a sense of peace. That kind of stuff for a man is like, Oh, yeah? Well, watch this. You know, is that, and it'll take more than once, but it'll be that that will help him. It'll be that that'll encourage him. It'll be that that'll lead him, and that's what it takes. Just like in physical intimacy, there's an initiator and there's a receiver. In spiritual intimacy, there's a calling to be an initiator And there's one who's to be the receiver and the responder. And so, ladies, he will need your encouragement, a lot of it. And he will rise to the occasion when he senses that it's valuable to you and when he gets the encouragement he needs along the way. Number six, spiritual intimacy has enemies. Yeah, wouldn't you know it? That there'd be some force of opposition. There'd be some resistance here in the process. Yeah. Those enemies are selfishness, resentment, criticism, silence, resistance, anger. All of those work against spiritual intimacy. You see, life is not cut into compartments. Life is not this neat set of boxes that says, okay, well, this is uh, work this is home, this is spiritual, this is family. It's not like that. It's all woven together. So if you want to have spiritual intimacy in your marriage, you're going to have to avoid conversation and heart attitudes that come out as selfishness, resentment, and anger because those those put walls up, if you remember Sunday. Those build walls. And where there's a wall, there won't be intimacy. Where there's, where there's a barrier, there can't be oneness. Where there's a barrier of some kind, there can't be open-hearted vulnerability. You can't have intimacy when there's a barrier. So you have this passage here from Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Another another word I like to put in place of grace sometimes <clears throat> is desire. If you look at it, don't let any corrupt words proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification or building up, that it may impart desire to the hearers. If you want your spouse to be open and honest and create an environment of trust, intimacy, you, it's going to come through your language and your tone and your how you communicate. Verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. You're not gonna, you're not gonna all of a sudden say, "Oh, it's Thursday night, seven o'clock, time for our spiritual intimacy hour." 
when the rest of the week has been bickering back and forth and yelling and upset, anger through the house, it's just not going to work that way. You're going to have to build this oneness throughout your conversation, throughout your life, sharing your heart. You're always on guard, watching your words, watching your tone, watching how you communicate. If you want to get to a place of intimacy, you got to do the work of creating the space ahead of time. And all that stuff has to go. I don't, there's really no excuse for it. If you want to get to the deepest levels of intimacy, that stuff has to leave. You can't expect to have anger, yelling, and all this stuff going on and then wonder, well, how come we're not spiritually close? You're not doing the work. You're not creating the space. You're not opening the door. You're not doing the intentional work of creating a space where people feel safe or your spouse feels safe to be open. Number seven, spiritual intimacy is the passionate prayer of Jesus for your marriage. In John, Jesus is about to go to the cross. He's about to be arrested. He's praying in the garden. He's praying. This is the time when the Bible records that he prays, and we read that it says he prays, and he has great uh, drops of blood come from his forehead. He's from the intentionality and from the passion he's praying. Some of the words from that prayer recorded for us here in John 17. And here's what Jesus said. Don't miss the point of this. He says, I do not ask for these only, but for all of those who will believe in me through their word. In other words, I'm not praying for just these disciples tonight that are with me here in the garden, but I'm praying for all those who will believe, which, by the way, that's you and me. He's praying for us in that garden. Verse 21, that they may all be one. That they may know what it's like to be one together. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. There's the picture. Jesus and the Father. You just imagine the level of intimacy they have, the closeness, the openness the glorying in one another, the openness with one another, nothing is held back, full sharing of all that they are with one another. And Jesus says, that's what I want them to know. That's what he wants us to know. That they also may be in us so that the world may believe you've sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. That's what Jesus wants for us, to become perfectly one together. Not just sex, but one on all levels. Every part of our being, every part of our soul, every part of our faith, our hopes, our spirit, our love, Every dimension of us open, perfectly one together. So here's some things I know. If Jesus is praying to the Father, I know that the Father hears him. And I know that the Father answers him. Okay? So I'm going to walk this forward like an old geometry problem back in seventh grade, all right? If this is true, then this is true. Do you remember all those postulates and theorems and all that kind of stuff? this is why you learn that math stuff. It helps you think. If this is true, then this is true, then this is true. If segment AB equals segment BC, then all that kind of thing, here it is. If Jesus is praying, does the Father hear him? Yes. Does the Father answer him? Yes. If Jesus is praying for us to be one, What is the Father going to do then? He's going to answer it, and he's going to see that you and I have all that we need to be one together. Right? We just walked it forward, followed a little bit of logic, so watch this. If we know that's true, then God is arranging your life in a certain way so that you and your spouse walk through the exact circumstances you need to so that you can experience complete oneness. Your circumstances are not random. They are not by someone else's hand. 
They are by God's hand. And he knows exactly what to bring into your life. The joys and the struggles. The blessings and the tension that causes you to come together and be one. The only question will be, will we respond to that? Will we see it as that? Or will we complain about this event, complain about that event, and criticize this thing that's happening and miss out on opportunities? Or will we say, you know what? This financial situation that's coming to our life right now, God is greater than that situation. And he has brought it so that it might bring us together in a greater way than we ever have been before. This is how God answers the prayer of Jesus. He'll bring blessings into your life. He'll bring need into your life to bring you two together at a level you've never been before. He's praying for it, and the Father's passionate about it, and he will not miss out on the opportunities for that to happen. Some of the times for Heather and I where we've um, experienced some of the greatest pain, whether it be through circumstances that happen to us or circumstances that happen because of us, were the actual things that led us to a place of greater dependence and trust in God and greater openness with one another. We've had some painful things happen to us. Um, there's been some times where I've experienced some pain. She's experienced some pain. Maybe sometimes it's physical. I've experienced it sometimes in ministry. We've experienced it. Um, we had a, a, a vandalism and burglary at our, at our house one time that was just devastating to us. It became very painful for us, but it also became very powerful in bringing us together when we took advantage of it and sought God in it. So... You can know this pursuit of intimacy is something that God himself is driving for you as well. Don't miss the moments that he's bringing to help bring you together. Number eight, spiritual intimacy develops as a couple goes through the struggle and the reward, believing God together. I mentioned to you earlier about Adam and Eve and how um, sometimes we look at the, at, the sec- at the section there before they sinned. You know, we're in the garden. It says, and they were, uh, and they were both naked and unashamed. You think, wow, that would just be awesome just to live in the garden. There's no sin. There's no problems. And they're both naked and they're unashamed. That must have just been amazing intimacy. I don't know. I'm sure it was amazing. But in some ways, I think what happens a chapter later reveals a deeper level of intimacy than what happened even in the garden. So if you walk forward, Eve takes the fruit, she eats. Of course, sin enters the world. Adam eats and sin enters the world. They start blaming each other. They hide, they run, and they they run off and they hide in the bushes and they try to make clothes for themselves to cover their nakedness, the Bible says, and and God comes walking in the garden, Adam, where are you? And they say, you know, they say nothing, and then they start blaming each other for it, and all those kind of things are happening there, and there's conflict, and God pronounces, well, from now on, because you've done this, you're Adam, you're going to work, and it's going to be toil. You're only going to gain by the sweat of your brow, and and Eve, from this point forward, you're going you're gonna to bring forth children in pain, and in labor you will have great pain and childbirth, all of these things, you know, and the, and the The serpent's cursed to the ground, and you will eat dust the rest of your life. All this stuff happens. You think, wow, they're never going to experience closeness again. This is going to be terrible and tragic. And then it says that God sacrificed an animal, and he clothed them. And then he made a promise that there'd be one who would come one day, and he would bruise the serpent's head even though the serpent would bruise his heel. So you get this new promise, and you get this new hope, and they go on, and they begin to have children. They have two sons. Life is good. We're living outside of the garden. God is with us. And then all of a sudden, one of the sons murders the other son. Oh, here we go again. 
life's terrible again. It's going to be miserable. And now we're just filled with bitterness and loss and tragedy and grief. And how are we ever going to get over this? And now we're rolling through. We're getting into chapter 4 and moving on further. You get down to the end of chapter 4, verse 25 and 26. I have those for you on your page. I want you to look at this carefully. And Adam knew his wife again. Now, I know sometimes comedians joke and say, oh, that's just the Bible's way of saying sex. You know, he knew his wife, you know, as though God were trying to write some, you know, clever word in there so we would say it in church, our children children wouldn't laugh at it. (laughs) No, there's intentionality here. When he says he knew her, that's not just code language for sex. That meant he knew her. He knew her heart. She knew his heart, known as they are known, knowing as they are known. He knew her. They came together again after all the tragedy. And she bore a son and named him Seth. And look what happens. It says, For God hath appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth... Tim, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. Look carefully what's happening here. They came together again after all of that tragedy. They were able to take in forgiveness and hope and peace and truly come together. God has brought us together. God is in our midst God has loved us in spite of all that has happened, in spite of what we've done. And they knew each other, and they had a child. What made it even greater was that child grew up and had a child. And then it says, men began to call on the name of the Lord. They had the blessing of his presence in their life. You see, by this point, There are actually a whole lot of people who have been born on the earth. Hundreds of years had passed. Remember, they lived a lot longer back then. And you might be thinking, wait a minute, where did all those wives come from? How did that happen? I thought, if they had sons, where did the wives come from? They had them all. They all came from Adam and Eve, and then their children, and then their children, and their children, and so on. You think, Brothers and sisters and cousins were marrying each other? Yes. You see, back then, the seed line wasn't very far from the original. And there wasn't as much distortion. And there wasn't a prohibition. And they did marry. And they were given in marriage. So don't get weirded out by this. This is a little side trail. I just don't want you to miss this out. It's not fairy tale stuff. It's real life stuff that really happened. The point being this, when there were plenty of people on the planet and there was plenty of reason for them to curse God because there had been murder and because there had been pain and because there had been grief and because Adam and Eve had messed this whole thing up and now they were living outside the garden, instead, because of the intimacy that they shared, it spread. And people said, we want to follow after the Lord. That only happens when there's spiritual intimacy At the core. When a husband and wife share that, their children and their children will say, we want what mom and dad had, not we want to get away from mom and dad. They'll all of a sudden want to call on the name of the Lord because that kind of spiritual intimacy is beautiful. That kind of spiritual intimacy is appealing. It's attractive. And it became the result. So, God will walk you through your unique life situations with intentionality to bring you to a place of spiritual intimacy. The struggles you go through aren't designed to keep you from it. They're actually designed to be what brings you to that place as you open your heart and say to your spouse, I really need you to pray for me. And you do. I really need to talk through this. And you do. I really need us to seek God together. And you do. 
That is when your hearts connect. That is when a deeper level of intimacy occurs. All right. On the bottom of the page there are some questions. I'd love for you to talk about these at your table. We've got about 10 minutes. Um, The questions are, what kind of role models have you had for a marriage and spiritual intimacy? Talk about that. What excites you most about developing this level of intimacy in your marriage? And then what kind of encouragement will you need personally to be consistent at developing spiritual intimacy? So y'all talk about those. We'll be finished in about 10 minutes.